on the video. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are so excited and happy to host you on this uh, one of, of a kind event. Uh, we are so happy because we are now moving from a single event to, uh, I would say, express forum. Uh, this is like a two hours uh, event today. We will be talking about a very important uh, subjects related to women and technology. This is something that we've been uh, embracing in Bahrain and looking forward to empower more women that can definitely uh, penetrate the market from the technology uh, perspective. There are a lot of opportunities. Uh, when we were preparing for this event, we were uh, talking with uh, some of the success stories around us. We thought this is a great uh, opportunity for women to really think about penetrating the market from uh, using fintech or as well any other platform related to technology. And today we'll be talking about what is the context of Bahrain, what happened around us, what are the enablers around us as well. We'll be talking about uh, some success stories. We'll be hearing from, from them directly, what they've been through, what are the challenges and what are the enablers. Uh, we at TPS believe that collaboration is very important for the success of the society. Looking forward for a great event. I'll just take you through maybe one minute uh, a presentation about TPS. Uh, although we, we maybe were late on uh, starting on time, so I will make it a very express. And then I will hand over uh, the whole moderation and event management to our brother Ahmed Bloushi. Uh, who will be taking care of the whole event uh, organization and as well toward the end he will be handling the panel discussion and actually special thanks goes to Ahmed uh, for those who don't know uh, since we started in 2012 the first event we did was with Ahmed al and uh, it was very tough at that time to dare to do stuff around people uh, that you don't know and Ahmed take that responsibility and he did a great presentation talking about IT strategy. He inspired me personally at that time. And I got to know a lot about uh, what he has as a person and what is the, the right methodology that he used. And you've seen Ahmed as well, uh, maybe handling or taking part of multiple events that we did on the, on the, the last two years as well. So thank you, Ahmed. Uh, I'll just quickly share the, the presentation. Share, and here we go. Uh, since I cannot hear any, any uh, confirmations, I would like to ask one of the panelists just to confirm that you can see the, the presentation. So I yes, can screen is clear. Perfect. Yeah. So we believe, as I said, collaboration uh, uh, is a key. So our slogan is actually collaborate to innovate. There are a lot that we can share among us and, and competition uh, is not in everything. Uh, the regulatory framework, the enablement environment, the knowledge is all things that we would like to emphasize that people should, should definitely share it within the society. Uh, the, back to the society that has been established in 2012. We got the approval at that time. All of the text that you will, will go through today has been written in 2011. And we, within the next year, the 10th anniversary of the society, we will be revisiting a lot of our uh, vision and mission statements. However, it's still inspiring us. And if I will go, uh, for example, to the, to the vision, it's very simple. We would like to see Bahrain competing at a global scale. Uh, and this is something that we believe government alone um, uh, are doing a great job, but they will never be able to achieve that without the collaboration from all parties within the society. And, and TPS is positioning uh, itself as a, a platform of collaboration for all IT and technology leaders, uh, where they meet the business, business team and discuss uh, various important subjects. Uh, how we, uh, we we define a couple of goals, and those goals go beyond just uh, collaboration. We support the green ICT. We support research on specific subjects. Uh, we we as well uh, uh, 
support the education systems uh, through uh, innovation and use of technology. We did a great job with the uh, views international school in the past and, and creating their uh, strategy document. Um, all of that is towards supporting uh, the community, supporting Bahrain to, to reach to the next level. Um, there are many ways that we can achieve that. And this is one of the, uh, I would say this page is only uh, an example of the things that we, we aim to do in the past. We have a couple of committees that are active. We have AI committee, information security, uh, green ICT. All of these are things that has been done on, on the past and their uh, uh, contribution is ongoing. So it's not gonna stop. Uh, we have participated in consultation of multiple uh, non-government and, and government entities on the past. Since we have uh, good thinkers, good leaders on the technology team, we would like to help and meet companies and just give them advices. We don't talk about small solutions here, I'm talking about uh, enterprise. This is where we, we believe that we can uh, create value. This is actually the gap that has been identified back in 2011 when we, we thought, where is the community that uh, hosts all of these uh, uh, IT leaders and professionals? So that's why we created a TPS. This is quickly going through what, what we have, uh, at least for the last two years, we converted from being only members uh, society so, so from 2012, we did maybe 30, 40 events. And all of these were only for members. From 2019, we thought, oh, this is something uh, we would like to share it with, with the whole community. So we converted to a public events. And so this is just an example uh, of today's event, uh, definitely women and technology. And uh, during the pandemic, we did maybe, uh, I mean, 2020 specifically up to now, we did a couple of events that have been uh, focused on how people uh, could actually benefit from the post-pandemic era and how they uh, should handle the situation. Definitely, we know that technology were a key enablers for uh, government and society to operate in a different operating model. And that has been uh, witness and education and health and, and, and other aspects within the society. So the, as you can as you can see, uh, various topics, blockchain, cloud, we did some events with a AWS as well, talking about risk. Uh, as you can see, Ahmed has been appeared here a couple of times. So that's why I want to thank him again. Uh, I would like now to hand it over to uh, my brother Ahmed. Uh, the mic is yours and, and I will stop sharing right now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michal. It was... Uh... Indeed, really working with the TBS and the and the, you know with the board and their uh, members as well. And thank you for uh, allowing me to moderate uh, this uh, session. Uh, and um, I would also like to, you know, uh, welcome all of our uh, panelists who will join us today and to discuss their. Uh, experience really in, in the startup world, especially in technology, where technology is becoming a very important aspect in our daily lives, as well as in the business uh, area. So um, the way we'll do it, uh, you ha we have the guest of speakers, we'll allow them to share their experiences, and then uh, we'll have the panel discussion, which will have also the Q&A. So if you have any questions uh, to our esteemed panelists, uh, please, uh, we'll leave it at uh, the end, okay? So um, before, um, uh, what we, we're going to start is, uh, uh, I think we'll start with uh, Amy Vaya. Uh, Amy Vaya is the founder and CEO of My Gold uh, Soup. And we look forward, uh, Amy, to listen from your insights and your experience with such a, a very interesting idea uh, that uh, I really would like to hear more about. Amy, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I would like to say thank you also for TBS for putting together such a wonderful event. And uh, thank you to all of the um, 
people that have showed up to attend this session. Thank you. So uh, my name is Amy Vaya, and I'm the founder of Mike Old Souk. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about my business, uh, not so much to tell you what the business is, but hopefully to share with you some things that I learned along the way, which hopefully it will inspire other entrepreneurs and it will encourage you and it will show you maybe how opportunities are all around us. So um, I have a couple of things that I would like to share my screen and just show you. So this is a very personal story for me, okay? This is my um, family photos going back to 1937. My great grandfather was the first jeweler here in Bahrain. And uh, what you see here is his shop and then my grandfather's shop in the middle photo and then my father when he was a young man in his shop. And, and then there's me at that time. So this really jewelry was in my blood, okay? And I, I guess, I, I think I should have told you actually what my gold soup does. Sorry, we are a platform that sells jewelry directly from the factory to customers online. But this is the journey of how it came about. So this was very much in my family history. And my father closed his business 15 years ago. Okay. And he closed it because it's a very labor intensive business. You need people that you can really trust. And after his brother got married and moved out of Bahrain, he couldn't deal with it all, all by himself. Uh, his kids were young and then we went to college. So he didn't have support. So he closed the business. And I was away from Bahrain for a long time, but then I came back eventually. And then my brother came back and now we have all our uh, education and we have some new ideas about the world. And we were thinking like, it's such a shame that this business stopped. You know, because if if my father didn't have that business, we wouldn't even have had an education. Right. So we were feeling really sad and we were thinking, OK, what were my father's problems? And we realized that he was trying to he didn't know how to modernize the business. And we realized that if we apply the power of the Internet to his problems, we would be able to solve them. Right, we, we broke down the business exactly where were the problems, where were the benefits, what are the good parts that we should keep. And we realized that the shop itself needs to go. And you can do that now, you can move it online with the power of the internet. That's what e-commerce has done, it's a wonderful thing. It's been around for a while, just nobody thought of applying it to jewelry. But, uh, and you know, if you've ever like uh, done a, any course on entrepreneurship or attended a seminar, you will hear that uh, they tell you to solve a problem. And uh, okay, we were solving my father's problem, but that's not good enough. I guess uh, my dad's problem. We thought, okay, maybe maybe we can solve the problem for all of the jewelers in Bahrain, like help all of them to go online. Uh, but we realize that we're not going to make very much money that way. And at the end of the day, it is important uh, for you to be rewarded financially for the efforts that you're making. And then we realize we've never been thinking about this, but we're actually solving a huge problem for the customer. And now we actually have a business. And what was that problem? It was so simple. We were like, how can we make jewelry less expensive? That was really it, right? I have never, ever had to convince a woman to buy jewelry. And then when you tell her that she can get the same product that she's been buying in the market, but at a better price, they're sold. I had no further convincing to do. And that's how the whole idea of Michael Souk came about. And so I'd like to tell you in more detail, what we do really is we get the jewelry from the factory where it is made. So we sell it to customers at factory prices. Just to go into this a bit of detail, you see um, when you buy jewelry, you pay some of the money towards the gold, some of it to the craftsmanship, some of it goes to, uh, craftsmanship is the factory. And then a lot of it goes to the showroom because the showroom is so expensive, the rent, the salaries, the insurance, maintaining inventory. And the internet just allowed us to remove that whole thing. So we make our money, but the, the price to the customer is lower than it would have been in the market. And it's the same product, same quality guarantee. The gemstones are certified by the government. The gold is certified by the government. 
so but we're not just delivering a great price we're also delivering convenience because we deliver it to your house we're delivering transparency because you know if you go to a shop there is no actual price tags on anything they have to like they whip out a calculator and they count okay as per today's gold rate this is how much you have to pay and usually they are charging different prices to different customers i mean you can try it for yourself uh you can go very nicely dressed one day and ask for the price of something and the next day you can try going in your like track suit and ask for the price of the same item and you will get a different price so we removed that we made it transparent we made it the same for everybody and of course you can buy it as a gift and you can just have it delivered directly to the um, uh, the recipient so that was that was that right we solved a crucial problem and we did it quite by trial and error uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop sharing this for a second and i'm gonna come back so we we came across this quite by trial and error so that is i think the next lesson is you should just be willing to experiment. Your first idea might not be the idea. Your second idea might not be the idea. The third one might not be it. But if you keep going, if you really believe in what you're doing, you'll get there. You'll get to that, that point where you realize, yes, I have something special on my hands now. And that's what happened to us. And we know that we had hit on that winning idea because immediately, we had so much excitement from people that we spoke to. Yes, this is a great thing. This should exist. How come no, nobody ever thought of this? So now this brings me to uh, the next kind of lesson that I learned along the way, which, um, uh, you know, the theme of this event is about collaboration, right? So really, I want to say that you should not be afraid to ask for help. Um, the jewelry industry is very, very male dominated, uh, as you can see from my um, pictures, right? Uh, you can see that it was all men and then suddenly there's me. And what that meant was that it was difficult for me to get into this, uh, for sure, because there are men in the production side of things, there are men in the sales side of things, um, and there are men even doing the design. And I don't know why they had never really thought of a woman being there at the beginning for all stages of this, but I could see that I added so much value because first of all, I actually wear the jewelry myself. So I have an idea of what a good design is and what other women, particularly my age, like to wear. And then on the production side of things, I was able to guide them and say, this is how this piece needs to look. I don't care what you want to do. I'm telling you that this is what the customer wants because I am the customer. And I was able to bring a whole fresh new perspective to this thing that it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't put my hands into my father's business. Now, um, my co-founder is my brother, and I was lucky um, that I, I have a brother. Um, if I'd had a sister, then she would have had the same challenges about how do we go to the factories and how do we talk to these guys? You know, they've never seen a woman coming in here. But that just goes to show you should be brave. You should not be afraid to step out into spaces where women have not been before because you never know, it just it might be just the thing the industry is waiting for. And if, if it's really like very, very difficult for a woman to get into a space, we should be able to collaborate. We should be able to ask your brothers, your uh, cousins, your fathers, your friends for help, or, or a man might be the first hire in your uh, company because it's it's not us against them. It's not men versus women. It's about collaborating for success. And on the flip side, I should tell you that, you know, when we pitched, uh, when we pitched this business idea to investors, they told us, oh, so you're targeting women. But no, we're not targeting women. Half of our customers have been men who want to buy jewelry for their wives and mothers and daughters. Um, so we would have been totally blind also to half of our market if we had taken that attitude of men versus women kind of thing. We are not building products or solutions for women, by women. We are building for all of society to get better. We're adding value for everyone. So I think that is an important thing to keep in mind as you go about your journey. Um, then the other thing that I want to highlight to you is again, um, I'm going to share my screen again and show you this. Um, so, 
our tech is not very expensive, uh, or sorry, it's not very complicated. It's just an e-commerce platform. But even that was able to create such a substantial change to the way that this business is done. So there's no like deep tech AI kind of, we didn't invent software for this. So even if you're not a very tech savvy woman, that should not put you off. The internet itself in its most basic form is amazing technology. And you can definitely harness the power of it to make incredible things happen. You can connect with people that you could never have connected with before. You can come up with solutions that you never could have done before, simply with something as simple as the internet, or in our case, an e-commerce platform. So if you don't have coding experience, if you're not very tech savvy, that doesn't mean that you can't be a tech entrepreneur. There are absolutely so many opportunities. This space is so vast. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that you don't have to be creating something entirely new. Um, you could be modernizing an industry that has not been modernized in a very long time. So if you're looking for opportunities, sometimes the best place is to just look around you and see, is there a way to do this better? Is there a way to make this faster, cheaper, more efficient, more profitable, and then go from there? Um, the, the next piece of advice that I learned from like doing this business is that just start, start anywhere. It doesn't matter. Uh, we started our business before we actually had all of our paperwork in place. So we started selling just to our friends and their friends. And we actually crossed $40,000 in sales in a few months. We delivered to Saudi Arabia, to the UAE, to the USA for Christmas presents. We onboarded three factories here in Bahrain who are producing uh, items for us. And we onboarded two diamond dealers. So we're getting uh, diamonds at wholesale prices, excellent prices. But we just started. We, start, we have to start somewhere. If we had waited for all of the paperwork to be done and all of that, we would have just lost a lot of time. And in fact, when we showed investors the traction that we had had, they could see that we really had a good idea worth investing in. And they had a lot of confidence in us as well. So we were accepted into the Flat6 Labs program, uh, which we completed last month. And then we have been in talks with uh, some angel investors and some other VCs, and they have a lot of confidence in us because we've proved ourselves. Um, so then that brings me to another point, which is that the people who succeed are the people who work hard. So there's absolutely no way around it. We worked very, 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 very hard, but you will know that you are doing the right thing for you when it doesn't feel like work. So I would be at, at my diamond dealer's office sorting through diamonds and it never felt like work. I enjoyed it so much. And um, you know, in any product, if you sell something to someone and they give you money back, well, the transaction is finished. But in my case, I would be getting messages the next day or the next week. Hey, thank you so much. My wife really loved this. I was like the star husband, you know, on her boy on her birthday. Or thank you so much for doing the engagement ring. My fiance loved it. And you're going to be a part of our special day for the rest of our lives. And that was so <coughs> satisfying for me. So it didn't feel like work. And you'll know when you're working on something, when it doesn't feel like work, you are doing what is right for you. Um, and then the last thing that I would really like to say is that uh, we don't give enough time for creativity. There is such a focus on hard work. Yes, it's important, but you can't always be working hard. You have to st set some time aside to just think, to be creative. Like my brother and I, we had this idea on a coffee break, you know, it, we were working from home and we were bored and frustrated. You couldn't go anywhere outside. So we used to just go for a daily like takeaway coffee at the drive through and we would just talk. And that's how the idea happened. And we kept up that practice. Every time we have a problem in our business, we're like, you know what? We're not going to solve this by just sitting here and worrying. Let's just take a break. And when you take a break, the best ideas come to you. So 
I think I think women understand this, but men are understanding this too, because I've read a lot of productivity articles, which, you know, the best entrepreneurs of the world, they set aside some time each week to just think and read and uh, be creative. And uh, I have found that that has been very, very useful for my business. So I would urge you to do that. Or even if you're working in a job currently, still set aside half a day just for you to think be creative or not even think like just relax because you know some of the best ideas come to you when you're not expecting them so i would just like to say thank you so much to everyone for your time it has been such a privilege to speak to you i hope that um, you got something that you can take away from this and that some of my experiences might help you on your journey and good luck to all of you oh thank you very much uh, amy a lovely presentation especially how you use a simple technology to disrupt uh, a very ancient uh, business uh, model. Thank you, Amy, and uh, we'll have to discuss this more at the panel discussion. Now, uh, all over, uh, all from, uh, all the way from Kuwait, uh, we have uh, Nora Asker. She's the founder and CEO of uh, Notary Box. Uh, Nora, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, but just just to double check, um, you'd like me to just talk about the journey and a bit about Nutribox and how I became a tech entrepreneur? Yes, please. Okay. But, um, so I'm actually a clinical nutritionist by degree uh, turned health tech entrepreneur. Um, my journey began in, uh, let's say, let's say 2013. Um, so my brother and cousins are actually uh, the partners and owners of Talabat before it got acquired by Rocket Internet. And um, I used to always uh, go to Talabat HQ and spend lots of time there um, and just being inspired by the startup culture and um, about just um, product design, uh, UI, UX, uh, the, the different aspects of building a business. Um, going a bit, tracing a bit uh, earlier than that, so um, I graduated um, from you know, my postgrad in the UK. I came to Kuwait uh, very young, 23 years old, and um, built the nutrition department at one, of the at one of the top private hospitals in Kuwait from scratch. So it was sort of a um, an intrapreneurship, let's say. So. Yeah, and in Maka, there was no department uh, back then, and we built it, turning it into a top operating profit center and um, getting it accredited. And uh, my journey into nutrition began from there. Oh, I used to witness yeah, a main, a big pain point um, from all the uh, patients and uh, people that I used to see at the clinic, at the hospital, and during my conferences abroad. F it, it got me thinking and I kept on seeing the same thing over and over again. Oh, I'm a problem sol solver and I love solving problems. Um, 2013, I, I, um, we, I had, I, I co-founded a startup that was like an urban juice bar before the trend started in Kuwait or in the region where instead of going to a pharmacy, you would go to a juice bar and you would have science backed uh, recipes that would help you um, get better or become healthier. But I thought you know, this would help solve people's problem. And um, what uh, I didn't know what entrepreneurship was, but I got selected at, um, to join um, a program uh, called the Khur, where they select 30, 30 Kuwaitis um, and um, we join um, we joined a pro an entrepreneurship program in Cornell in New York. And um, so I was very new to the entrepreneurship world. I went, came back um, and um, we had the juice bar for about two years. Uh, my partner and I parted ways and I wanted to do something uh, more focused on um, the problem of overweight and obesity as a whole. Um, fast forwarding to let's say end of 13, 14, where I used to go to um, the HQ at Talabat and just interact with everyone, the culture there, and just learning and absorbing quietly. And we used to always say, when I had it, when I have a tech startup. 
um, it opened it opened my eyes to I have no tech background. It opened my eyes to how tech can help you um, cross borders and just um, yeah, any build a platform bigger than yourself and help people people on a bigger scale than what I was doing at the moment. So uh, back at my corporate job, I've yeah, any I I've been there. Um, min you know, seven, till 2016 so that's about seven years i was director of nutrition i felt and i reached my peak and i'm like what's next yeah there must be something another way where i can help people at a bigger scale and 2016 i resigned from um my corporate job which was yeah, a very sort of a safety net and um decided to enter the entrepreneurial world of of uh, to enter the world of tech and build Nutribox from scratch. Um, back then, yeah, I've been exposed to the ecosystem. Um, 2000, 2000 and, um, 2015, we, we got selected to, Nutribox was still an idea, we got selected to, um, as finalists at the MI, MIT F Pan Arab um, conference uh, it's an event where where you apply then they select idea stage startups um, social startups and um, seed saves stage startups let's say so um, that was my my first venture uh, 2015 into sort of yeah any getting my hands dirty and writing out the idea it was just pen on paper, um, a lot of sort of, uh, sort of you know, a lot of just uh, inspiration from different, from the problems that I used to see and ways of solving it. And we got selected as finalists. So I believed in the problem. I'm in, in the solution. I was passionate about the problem that I was solving. Fagilt in Nanura, just give it a go, give it a shot. So that was, sorry, that was 2015, 2016, end of 16, I resigned and I, um, started the journey, uh, scouted out developers. Uh, keep in mind, I had no, no tech background. So I did a lot of research, a lot of reading, um, and it taught me how to become resourceful. Uh, we, we found, um, I found a tech, uh, sort of a, a tech team. They were Eastern Europeans in Dubai. We went backwards and forwards, building the architecture together. They helped me with the design. And um, it was gonna be this huge, um, platform that would be a marketplace and would help people find healthy food around them. And at the same time, they would have a nutritionist with them in their pockets and so many different features. Oh, um, back then I didn't, yani, it was an idea, I didn't know the feasibility. So the, the developers um, suddenly said that, uh, Noura, this is too big. We cannot do this, we cannot, it cannot be done. This was Jan 2017. Um, you have to be resilient. So I, 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 I believed in it. Yeah, and you worked uh, in uh, as well. Um, Talabat was just acquired, right? So it just gave me sort of that inspiration and anything is possible. And I used to see the hard work and dedication and commitment the team used to put in. So, um, it inspired me to just move forward and, and give it a go. So I, I searched for... Um, I went out and scouted developers um, online and it was a company and um, we began building Nutribox uh, from scratch and I, and I like to get my hands dirty. So I like um, going down to the nitty gritty of things and finding, uh, yeah, understanding how things work. So throughout that journey, I, I became tech savvy and dealing with developers firsthand and getting my hands dirty throughout the journey, not just giving them sort of the features and letting them develop it, that empowered me and helped me become a stronger techpreneur. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, used to tell me, Noura and Tayani, uh, what, what are you doing? You're a nutritionist. What are you doing in tech? You don't know what you're doing and um, you're not gonna succeed because you don't have any background. You need a CTO. And finding a CTO, that, that sort of journey of finding your core founding team is difficult. And um, I, if, yeah, it's, 
it's not, it's not, it's not, it's like a chicken and egg situation. So should you wait for your team and then start to build or should you build and then find your team through the, through, throughout, throughout your journey? So that's what I did. Um, I, I went ahead and I built, I learned my, I learned myself and uh, we built Nutribox. So we built the architecture together with our team of engineers, backend, frontend, uh, systems architect, and um, Nutribox was launched beta version, very close beta version, 2018. And it was a two-sided marketplace where you have nutritionists and um, multi-specialty nutritionists and um, uh, sort of like um, a database or let's say um, a library of healthy food that you can find around you, curated to you and your health needs. Uh, that was end of uh, 18, we, we launched sort of small beta um, we got accepted into um, our pre-seed program at one of the top accelerators in the UAE called Shara. And uh, this, is, this is where sort of the magic happens. And it helped me hone in on the customer journey of Nutribox and sort of uh, tweak the product to be deliverable as a first version of Nutribox that can actually go to market and, and users would understand the, the core value that we're offering. Fast forward to uh, February 19, we launched and um, uh, we grew organically uh, from there. So Nutribox is self-funded. We have a clean cap table and um, we entered the market. Uh, everyone was uh, excited, whether it was users or, or our, team, our team as well. Um, and... Uh, um, Moving, moving forward um, and acquiring our users, we we began to see that, um, yeah, and we began to understand the market and what the customer actually wants, and and how to sort of fine tune our business model to create a sustainable revenue stream. Um, moving to oh, sorry, hem. It's quite a it's quite a deep journey. So going back 2017, we were actually selected. Um, as the top 10 startups by Zane Great Ideas. So we, were, we went to San Francisco, um, San Francisco and the UK to attend uh, an accelerator there. So we were startups in residence. That was 2017 uh, before I established Nutribox and got it licensed and set up the whole company in Kuwait um, in, 2000, in mid 2018. But that was 17 December. Um, I hope that everything is sort of making sense. Um, so going back to 2019, um, it was, it was a learning curve. So we understood, um, we, we understood our customer more. We understood what they wanted. We also, so when you, when you build, when you build a, a product, you have to look at all the angles, um, your customer journey. Are you adding value to the customer? Is the customer really finding this useful or or is it just speculation on, on your part? And when you build a, pro a product, it's based on hypothesis and based on maybe your experience and based on testing that you've done on the market before actually um, uh, launching it. Uh, 2019 was sort of our growth phase where we uh, discovered the market and discovered what the user, what, what our users uh, uh, wanted. Um, 2020 was um, COVID happened, but that was where the shift happened for Nutribox. Um, we, we were able to help um, 750 uh, users in total active users transform their lives. We partnered with one of the top banks in Kuwait, Bank Bobian, where we helped 500 individuals and their, and their um, families. Um, improve their immunity through a holistic program that we developed at Nutribox, an immunity boost boosting program. In, in Ramadan, um, Ram May that year, Ramadan 2020, we were able to, um, to help um, 100, 100 plus people from the, from the Arab world lose a collective of 400 kilos from their weight and then move and then after that, we, we, had, we had other sort of um, campaigns and, and community campaigns and initiatives where we, we began to, to actually acquire paid users. And this is where the switch, switch happened and we pivoted our model from becoming a two-sided marketplace 
to a SaaS-based model that is powered by machine learning and um, a decade of data gathered, gathered through my experience at the clinic where um, now Nutribox is literally your pocket nutritionist that empowers you to live and lead a healthy life through behavior modification a lifestyle change and diets personalized to you. So um, it's, it's been a, uh, a very uh, yani rich, uh, yani rich and um, deep learning curve uh, to date where um, we're uh, launching our, our new pivot, inshallah, uh, this Ramadan, where we have a, a Ramadan challenge coming up. And the beauty of Nutribox is that it's border agnostic. So um, our users are currently from all around the world, Saudi Arabia, we have a couple from, from the uh, US and uh, that's, that's the beauty of, of the platform. And um, we, we made that pivot into a SaaS based model. And uh, what we realized with Nutribox, it being a marketplace, the barrier to entry is our barrier to entry was very low. And instead of using my um, uh, sort of um, uh, industry expertise and product expertise for Nutribox, we, we created a marketplace that anyone else can do. So with the SaaS based model, we utilized our, our own, you know, our team's um, USP to create something that will really add value to the end user, to our customers and um, give us sort of that scalability and uh, to, to just scale across, uh, across the region. Um, where we're bootstrapped up until now through um, uh, grants that we that we uh, won uh, through our accelerator, our pre-seed and seed accelerator with Shira, and uh, regional competitions that that we we won as well. Um, we now have uh, a solid team, and um, Nutribox is uh, is Yanni raising our first uh, seed round. Oh, um, what I learned what I learned throughout the journey uh, so far is. And, and we're and yeah, and you, let's say our journey is just is just beginning beginning now, and that anything and everything is possible. You just have to uh, learn the ropes as you go along, and um, not let anyone put you down or tell you that it can't be done. And uh, um, two years ago, I would not have thought that I would be here in Bahrain now, having won, we just won the Startup Bahrain competition. So we've moved here in Bahrain to set up our regional HQ and uh, we believe it's the perfect environment and balance to grow and scale a startup sustainably and um, to become a global startup. Oh, um, uh, hey, any tech from, from, from tech being Japanese to me, Three years ago, it is now my second language. So I work very closely with the tech team, uh, building our system architecture, our integrations. We moved our tech in-house, which is very important. Um, because we're bootstrapped, we've been focusing on our tech stack, our technology and our product, rather than our sort of marketing, let's say. Our marketing has been very organic, um, which is why our growth has been slow but steady. And now that we have um, found our product market fit after, uh, after yani, um, uh, yani, uh, a deep and, and rich journey, which is how I believe it's supposed to be, and the milestones that we have reached, keeping in mind that we're bootstrapped, uh, have been very large milestones. And now we're ready to raise our uh, first seed round, which is a very small round uh, that we need, uh, to be honest, yani, between 300 to 500 uh, K uh, US dollars to just um, enter the market and grow Nutribox um, into the vision that we have it to be. So, so our comp one of our competitors, our competitors are global in the, in the States. Um, is actually valued at a billion US dollars right now. And um, uh, with, with our market knowledge and our, and our industry expertise and our, um, our really great engineering team, inshallah, yani we believe we can actually make that, uh, make that uh, happen. And um, 
E, and e, that's, that's sort of us uh, in a nutshell, I guess. Um, and uh, any sort of a bit snippets of, of advice I would say to any, any female entrepreneur or, or any entrepreneur that would want to, that is uh, a, non, a non, I would not, I wouldn't say, a now I would, I would consider myself a tech founder, not a non-tech founder. I don't code, but I understand tech very well. And I believe in uh, anyone who has the guts, gumption, determination, heart and courage and the openness to learn and willing to learn and not just give up can um, build and grow a successful tech startup. And, and the tech is the future. And in any industry, it is, it is our bridge to, um, to building scalable businesses. And um, you know, the generation now, our generation Z, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial, but you know, our, our generation Zs and younger, um, Tech is is tech is their day to day. I need tech is their um, their their day their sort of uh, means to live their day to day lives. Uh, I believe in any industry can can be positively disrupted through tech. And if you are an expert in that industry or domain and you're willing to learn and go through the journey, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Best. Uh, you can succeed and you can build a solid, scalable um, uh, product that inshallah yani, will, our aspiration is yani, for us to be uh, acquired by one of the um, global players that want to enter the uh, MENA region, inshallah. I hope awesome. that made sense. Um, no, Nora, uh, this is, was absolutely uh, beneficial and I'm sure that uh, Every country has its own, uh, you know, challenges and opportunities. But I think uh, all of us in all of the countries, especially GCC, we share uh, the same uh, challenges and so on. And I love the part where, you know, it is uh, you, you were able to pivot and, and uh, grow the business uh, there. And whether it's technology or not, it's all about filling the need, uh, solving problem and finding the technology that could help you solve that uh, problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nora, for your uh, time. I know you're busy and have uh, another yeah, uh, meeting. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank and, you very uh, much for having me, inshallah. Yani, yani was, uh, it was our pleasure. Uh, it's nice to have uh, uh, colleagues from Kuwait joining us. And as I said, it's all the same challenge and hope we collaborate and, and share experience. We're actually, uh, we're setting up our regional HQ here in Bahrain. We just got our CR and we're very excited about that. Uh, congratulations and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, we thank uh, Nora for uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, now we will, uh, uh, I would like to introduce Hana Farif. Uh, she's the Senior Executive of Tech and Innovation at uh, Bahrain EDB. But most importantly for today's uh, presentation, she's the founder of the Rasni. Hannah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmed. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today and share our stories. Um, I'm here with other uh, fellow women in tech uh, members whom will also be giving their perspectives or have given their perspectives in the tech community. Um, today, I'll be sharing some insight into myself as a, a female founder, uh, a mother, and uh, a digital platform enthusiast. Uh, my name is Hannah Al Tarif. I'm half Irish, half Bahraini, and I've been living uh, in the kingdom of Bahrain my entire life. Uh, I consider myself a global citizen, having been born in Ireland, grew up in Bahrain, and had the opportunity to learn within the Arabic slash Bahraini curriculum. Um, I've also learned the British curriculum uh, and uh, I've gained my GCSEs and A-levels and then I earned my bachelor's degree from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, to top it off, my mother was, being a, an Irish car cardiologist with like very high expectations of education also made me and my sister study the Irish curriculum school books in our spare time. And obviously, and to be honest, you know, we weren't quite thrilled with it at the time. 
Uh, however, long story short, um, this sort of provided exposure to four different educational streams across the world. And the fact that we had access as a family to, uh, to all sorts of educational resources from different backgrounds in the 1990s is what made Bahrain so accessible and so uh, such a great place to thrive. Uh, on a personal note, I'm a single working mom. Uh, I have uh, a nine-year-old daughter called Jude, and I've always been a multitasker and a person with impeccable time management and planning skills and problem-solving skills. Um, I used to work in banking uh, within the private sector, uh, and now I work with the Bahrain uh, Economic Development Board, Bahrain's Investment Promotion Agency, with the main strategic objective um, to create jobs for the citizens in our country. Uh, now, you may think all of this is sort of off topic, but this, these are what made um, Debrisni possible today. Like everyone else, uh, I had long working hours and I found it very difficult to keep up with expectations of private schools when it comes to my daughter. Uh, when I thought to find a private tutor to support my family, it was incredibly difficult to find the right one whether it was a schedule, standard of tutor or price. And so out of frustration and this huge gap in the market, I built a solution to this, uh, to this problem. So Derrisni, Teach Me, uh, is Bahrain's first web-based booking platform to find, book and pay for tutors and coaches um, in advance. Essentially, it's a booking system to support tutors to earn additional income. Uh, and to manage their private tuition schedules, as well as a platform for parents to find the right person for them, compare ratings and reviews, as well as pay digitally and in advance. We have fully operational websites and apps to include iOS and Android. And as of today, we have over 250 registered tutors using our platform. Uh, Derisni has been operational for just over 18 months now and earning 10% margin on every transaction. We have successfully completed just about 4,000 bookings and with just above 5,000 hours in total. In terms of users, Derisni has provided a platform for users to include parents and students to easily manage long-term bookings. With simple um, search features, um, parents and students are able to book a private tutor or coach using just a few clicks. And the last I checked it was about um, a minute long with uh, to include the payments. Um, based upon the analysis of users uh, since Derisni's inception, uh, we have managed to attract long-term bookings for parents who look to book private tutors for their children, starting as young as KG, all the way up to um, uh, graduation. And that's 13 years of private education booking potential. We already had uh, first year university students to return to us to book reputable tutors to support them with their private um, sessions all the way in London, uh, Dubai and Portugal to support with their digital lectures. Uh, we are on this journey to put Bahrain on, on Bahrain startup on the international map. Uh, like um, every other company, it's super important to support our local community and give back. Essentially, what we've done uh, in Darusni is digitize the process to provide larger benefits for unemployed teachers to grow uh, by accessing um, a larger international market. For instance, what we take pride is, in is that benefit to the unemployed. Uh, on that front, our top our unemployed um, teacher has managed to earn over 12,000 BD since she's joined the Rasni community. Her name is Miss Ala, and there are so many more like her. Of course, we started out as a booking platform for physical tuitions in Bahrain. Um, and since COVID-19, we pivoted to include digital sessions. Um, so all our physical ones were moved online. This brings up the pivot element, right, in tech. Um, just like everyone else, uh, we had to pivot and implement digital video tools and are continuously upgrading our platform to reach global users. Uh, some of these features have been implemented already to include courses offered by institutes, free resources, um, which is a library of educational videos. Uh, and of course, in-house communication tools are being implemented um, as well as we speak. We're also upgrading our iOS. We felt that the iOS wasn't going, you know, to the to the max. So we've just um, beginning of this year um, um, invested in a new iOS um, app. So hopefully that will also be able to provide that those features um, in, in an international audience and in a better way. 
Uh, our intention is to grow Derasni to become the leader um, of web-based booking platform for tutors and coaches all around the world, physically and digitally. I didn't want to bore you with numbers, but in terms of opportunity, the private uh, education market in MENA and the GCC uh, uh, region is estimated to be about uh, worth about $11.2 billion. And that's just a start. Private schooling is also growing substantially. Uh, um, uh, and um, there's huge potential for Bahrain and the GCC. Uh, we have global plans and with the, the kingdom's educational stakeholder support, we hope to reach that goal. Uh, so I encourage all female founders, entrepreneurs out there with great ideas to sort of embark on that journey. We know that uh, it will come with a lot of hardship, but with drive and perseverance, extraordinary companies can be born. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end uh, of the panel. Uh, thank you, Rana. Very interesting. We already have some comments from uh, our attendees that uh, the wrestling is a lifesaver. <laughs> so uh, already we've seen uh, the impact. Uh, thank you, Hana. And obviously, we'll have more questions uh, later on in the panel uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you, Hana. So um, we'll move to the uh, second part of the um, uh, of uh, our uh, web uh, event today. And in the second part, we'll focus more about fintech, given its an importance. Uh, globally and especially in Bahrain. And uh, before uh, we start, I just wanted to set the scene and, and give you a, a very high definition uh, on fintech in order for, for us to have a more, um, um, a more better discussion, and especially for our audience who are not aware of, that, uh, of this domain, to have a better understanding when our speakers uh, talk about their experiences in fintech. So if you just allow me a second uh, to um, share my presentation. Uh, if, if the moderator, moderator could allow me, please, to uh, share my, uh, allow control to share my presentation. Uh, Ahmed, maybe because uh, you are the only male in this event, <laughs> not allowed. Okay, it's not fair, but okay, I'll uh, put, uh, at least I will maybe just set the scene. No need for slides. I'm sure our speakers will give will have more insight on the uh, on the domain. So, what is fintech? Fintech is short for financial technology, and it is mainly uh, uh, concerns about the use of technology to provide innovative uh, banking or financial services for customers. So typically uh, uh, in the past, uh, financial services were only offered uh, by, uh, by the banks. Now uh, with the uh, availability of technology, a new startups came and used this technology to provide a better services uh, to the customers. Sometimes even without the need uh, of, um, uh, of and the, without the need of uh, of going through the banks, so there are very um, known um, domains uh, of fintech. For example, you have payments, uh, where you can send uh, money to each other. Things in Bahrain, for example, benefit pay. This could be considered as a fintech. We've also seen a lot of crowd lending on crowdfunding, where uh, if someone like any of us here would like to start a business and I don't have funding, I would go to the people crowd and fund me uh, to start my business or in case I need to lend money to do something, I can go to the crowd and people and give me money instead of going uh, to the banks. So it's a very uh, promising um, uh, industry. Uh, Bahrain is a, is a hub in, uh, in FinTech where uh, I'm sure this is a good segue to introduce our next speaker, which will she'll give us more uh, insight about this. Uh, so my next speaker is Yasmin al Safar. Uh, she's the manager of financial services at the ADB. Yasmin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today. And thank you for, you know, TBS for inviting me over to this session. Um, to be honest, I just wanted to say very inspirational uh, previous speakers. I've learned quite a lot as well. I mean, I've met them, uh, but it's good to hear the different things that everybody's been doing. Um, so maybe just a bit about myself, and then I can segue into sort of um, the theme of the topic, which is fintech. So um, like Ahmed mentioned, my name is Yasmil Safar, and I'm the manager of the financial services uh, team within the EDB. Um, and uh, for you know everybody here on the EDB, obviously, I've had my colleague Hannah also on the call from the same organization. What we're mandated to do is to kind of look and promote and attract investments into the country. Ultimately, what we're aiming to do is you know the creation of jobs. Um, and uh, maybe I can give you a flavor of the journey. So I'm not an entrepreneur myself. Uh, I'm not a startup. Um, I'm just sort of, like, let's say, a civil um, worker that has been involved in this ecosystem uh, from its inception, uh, especially on the fintech side. So our journey actually started back in 2016, because um, the way we've seen it, Bahrain has always been an you know, established financial institution, uh, a financial established you know, country. We have a stable kind of you know, uh, wealth of uh, experience in the sector and, you know, some of my colleagues on this call have had that experience. Uh, for example, you know, Ahmed is a classical example of someone who is from the banking sector, but who's also a technology, you know, uh, very familiar with the technology scene. So that marriage of those two segments was key to the, the birth and the inception of FinTech in Bahrain. And this is where we were kind of thinking, like, how could we bring that to Bahrain? How could we do that? Um, and uh, I would refer to the initial kind of uh, conversation here we mentioned, was it collaborate to innovate, which was also what we've kind of looked into because the way we've seen it, we haven't had the technology experience in Bahrain back then, like five, six years ago. We might have had it in different spread pockets, but the assumption has always been technology is with IT, but you know it doesn't translate into the other segments. Um, and we saw that financial services was a classical place for that evolution to take place. So what we had done back then is engaged with a lot of different uh, countries, uh, uh, people that have done it. I even remember my first conversation with, with, was with a consultant from Vietnam who from KPMG and he was like talking about, oh, you know, there are very exciting and innovative things happening in, in, in Vietnam and they're, you know, setting up innovation labs and they're setting some R&D centers. Um, have you seen what's happening in the UK with their level 39? So there's been these pockets of things coming up and we're like, okay, so where are we in this whole world map of fintech. Um, and this is sort of where we started our journey, at least my personal journey started here. Um, so traditionally what we've been looking at is working with, you know, traditional financial institutions, the, the brick and mortar banks, the brick and mortar kind of investment companies. But later on, you know, we've delved into the different fintech subsectors, which my colleague Ahmed kind of alluded to, which were the payment spaces, the crowdfunding spaces. Um, you know, uh, Bitcoins and cryptos, it's, it's been sort of things that have been popping up, blockchain, how does all that connect into each other? Um, and so um, the journey, I would say, started in 2016 and it's continuously evolving as we speak today. Um, and, you know, uh, and it's very exciting for me to always see that women have been part of this journey. Uh, I mean, from a, an interesting scale, uh, predominantly the team that I was working with was uh, women. Um, but obviously, you know, we needed the support and, and the, you know, the collaboration of also my men colleagues and, you know, some of them are still with us, some of them have moved on. Um, and, you know, uh, I think Ahmed, if I would refer to you, you've always been one of the pillars uh, as part of this initiatives, you know, previously. Um, so I do have one slide that I wanted to share with everybody to just give you a visual of the timeline and what Bahrain has done in that space. And I can kind of share a bit of that journey. Um, so this is a quick snapshot. So the way we've seen it is obviously, you know, because it's financial services uh, and it's technology, there has to be a marriage or, or some sort of uh, understanding of what are the regulatory requirements that would kind of come into place? What are the infrastructural needs? Who needs to be part of this journey? Who needs to be kind of onboarded? And we've been very lucky in Bahrain 
to have a obviously a single regulator and a regulator that was keen to embrace uh, putting Bahrain on the map as a fintech hub. Um, and so the journey, like we've mentioned, uh, and it's not only if, you know within our central bank regulator, you have to have the right infrastructure. The essence of why Bahrain was a financial you know, uh, hub was because of our telco infrastructure was very strong. That back in the 70s, where things were quite turbulent in the region, things have shifted from Lebanon to Bahrain, and then Bahrain was created as a financial hub. So the wealth of the experience has here, but it's always been around infrastructure and the technology we've had. We've been very big in innovation. We've been always up, you know, leaders in, in pioneering things. And this is pretty much a testimony to, to you know, the journey that Bahrain has embarked on. So in 2016, you know, there was a national telecom plan. The Bahrain regulatory sandbox was launched by the central bank in 2017 to support the, you know, the startups and the fintech players. A fund of funds has been launched in 2018. Um, obviously, you know, the, the infrastructure has always been continuously, you know, developed. So electronic transfers, electronic communications, everything has been trying to move into the digital space to all support the ultimate aim and vision of digitization across the multiple sectors. But fintech obviously is one of the key pillars that I've been involved in. Um, and, you know, it's quite a wide spectrum. There's a lot of different financing activities or financing. So you would see how digi digitization really um, you know, affects everything. So, you know, any platform or any technology or any of these existing models that we currently are aware of can be done technologically. And that obviously saves you scale, um, you know, cost. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's the customer's experience that matters. Um, you know, having a satisfied customer that is able to possibly, you know, open their bank account from home um, is always, you know, a, a great option. And I think with COVID, we've seen the need uh, of all this and, you know, just going to the supermarket these days or any stores and having your contactless uh, method of payment is just, you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's for me, it's something that I've seen grow and I've seen it becoming, you know, a reality, uh, you know, as, as early as 2016. But I mean, the effort that that will take place um, and all of the stakeholders that have been involved, it's all about, you know, sharing your experiences, uh, comparing notes, um, you know, collaboration, uh, you know, the, the issues that you might have as an individual, as an organization, or as a country are pretty much the same elsewhere as well. So it's all about how you can engage and how can you kind of, you know, arrive at the end point uh, collectively together. Obviously, there are, you know, people that will win, so people will lose, but ultimately the aim is how can we have a, you know, a more uh, kind of like a better world? How can we have these services? And I think the previous speakers have kind of alluded to a number of very interesting um, concepts of that technology does help us support. Um, you know, we're seeing very big uh, spaces in terms of data analytics, um, artificial intelligence within the financial services space. Um, I mean, I would encourage you to also kind of check what the central bank has been doing themselves. They are part of, um, global regulator kind of, you know, they speak to each other, they compare notes. Bahrain is part of the global fintech network. So, you know, in a sense, also, if you're a fintech that can be accepted into Bahrain, you could have the opportunity to also operate or, or test somewhere else. That is part of the network. Um, there's been a launch by the central bank of something called FinHub 973. And if everyone's not aware of it, I would encourage you to also check out on it. They're currently running out a hackathon on RecTech which is a new um, space that's you know, emerging in the sense of how does compliance technology and the banking and the regulators need to kind of meet up together? Uh, you know, what's the role of blockchain? How can that translate? And I'm not a technologist by, by any chance, but you know, through the experiences that you kind of meet with, with the, all these inspirational people that you actually get to speak with, you see the, the simple ways that you can use technology and the complicated algorithm, you know, uh, quants ways that, you know, technology is being used as well. Um, and so um, maybe just sort of, uh, just kind of like a, a word of what I've experienced myself is this is a really um, interesting space. Uh, you know, there is definitely scope for more development, for more, um, you know, um, opportunities. And I know, you know, some of my fellow speakers that will be speaking afterwards will be sharing their own personal experience of how they've managed to um, you know, use the current infrastructure and the ecosystem that is currently uh, in Bahrain to kind of uh, you know, move forward. There's been the launch of Bahrain FinTech Bay as well that has been uh, supported and supporting sort of by the industry. So 
we are in a very, I mean, at least I'm in a happy place where I see, um, you know, individuals themselves and organizations themselves actually doing uh, and, and, you know, um, sort of activities and projects within the fintech space. There is also a women in fintech um, initiative that is currently led by the Supreme Council of Women. Uh, and the idea is to encourage, uh, you know, women to participate in this space. Um, I'm not going to claim to be, you know, uh, there is inequality in things, but obviously, uh, you know, certain sectors are dominated by certain genders. Uh, it could be for various different reasons, but it's always great to see um, everybody having a voice um, in whichever field that they want to kind of, you know, uh, either excel in or work in. And, you know, this cannot be done with the, with sort of having one umbrella. It has to be a collective effort support. And I think the, the current Supreme Council woman also has uh, women, I mean, men members as part of that as well. Um, and one last point I would encourage you, I just actually got to receive an email. It's great to see how many people are looking to encourage the space to, you know, further develop. So I think the, um, the U.S. Embassy are currently running also a, a program called, uh, I think, Women Tech Founders, uh, where applications are open and, you know, you get to sort of uh, work. It's Google powered, and I don't know if maybe people on the panel are already aware of it, but the applications are open. I would encourage you to check their websites as well. So there's quite a lot that is happening. Um, personally, I my background is purely in economics and financial services. I did a degree um, undergraduate, sort of um, an area around entrepreneurship. And when I remember my university days, so I, I studied in the US and it was everybody, you know, they had R&D centers within the universities. They always had these innovation labs. Um, you know, you work with a professor, you work with colleagues and you're always trying to innovate and think of ways of sim simplify things. and um, the university I went to was Johns Hopkins University was very well known, obviously, for medical, but they were also known for applied sciences in the health department. So what I kind of saw when I was in university is the, the meeting of technology with health, um, you know, data analytics, all of that lot. So it was really um, inspiring back then. And it's great to see that Bahrain is also part of that development as well as a country. Uh, I'll leave it here and then maybe, you know, allow Mohammed to kind of segue into the next session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yasmin. Uh, we were very proud to see how, you know, EDB in collaboration with other uh, government entities are really positioning Bahrain to be in the front front, and especially in, in FinTech and so on. We are much more advanced in other countries and uh, we are actually helping other countries in establishing their uh, hubs and so on. So thank you, Yasmin. You've set the stage for our next speakers where they are CEOs and founder of their own FinTech uh, businesses. So the next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Kawthar Al-Gallaf. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of eJamia and another business called WeCAE. Kawthar, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm a proud member of uh, Technology and Business Society as well. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I can reflect on my background uh, first. Uh, basically, I come from management information system background from the uh, University. And also, I studied risk management, project management, and I worked in the financial sector and insurance for a couple of years. Uh, then I moved to work, do, doing uh, projects in the community service, and it was focused on the uh, health awareness and all of that. Um, me as a person, uh, I was a leader since I was in high school, and I uh, I love inspiring people and you know uh, start working on things and I accept challenges. So um, that made me take a decision a couple of years back that it's time for me to start my own business. I will go through, share with you now, uh, the presentation for my fintech. But before that, let me just elaborate on the two projects that I've been working on. It's not only for the fintech. I'm a CEO and a founder uh, also in WeCAE, which is a company that provides um, um, basically vir virtual services uh, for events. And we are organizing this event and we are really glad and happy to be part of it. Uh, Actually, eJamia is a very uh, simple uh, concept. It's a concept that we have uh, in our tradition and culture. And gladly, I was working on this uh, for the past two years. 
It's a bit challenging, but uh, thank God we won uh, the award of Printech Hackathon by Benefit in Central Bank of Bahrain. And also we got recently incubated by Helsinki organization and we will be flying to Washington DC in July. And we got the privilege to be a partner with AWS. Well, the concept is very simple. As I uh, mentioned, it's a, a financial support system where people come together to collaborate and saving. But we move it to, uh, to utilize the technology to have it more easy for people to have access to it. And now I'm going to talk about how ideas can transform to reality. The first thing is that every entrepreneur should find a problem and try to solve it. And the next thing is to do a proper research. By research, uh, studying the market and checking on the resources, that will help uh, to like find the proper market and find the right solution for it. Then uh, the target audience, of course, who are gonna use the product, uh, considering the demographics, uh, uh, psychographics as well, and then you have to validate, always test and validate and always have a prototype. There is no such thing as perfection. It's a journey that we have to go through challenges. And one of them is to keep on adopting and uh, developing the product. Take action is very important, regardless what are the challenges, regardless what is the obstacles, you have to keep going. And also it has the, uh, the objective or the goal has to be aligned with your personal objective as uh, an entrepreneur. Of course, ideas are, 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 um, won't work unless you acted, yeah, acted upon. Uh, some of the things that could stop entrepreneurs from uh, implementing their ideas or start working on their ideas is the fear of failure. And it's psychologically that everyone have that fear, but if you overcome the fear of failure, there is a big chance for success because success never been built on success. It's built on failure. Uh, overwhelmed of ideas, you have to classify your ideas, which one is more feasible, which one is fit, uh, given uh, the research that, that you, you will, do, will be doing. Gratification is another thing. Seeking people, people validation or support from people is not a, a, a target. Um, it's nice to have people support, but you should keep going regardless if you get support or not and commitment, of course. Uh, there are so many opportunities rely within the entrepreneurial uh, journey. One of them uh, that you can fill up your knowledge gaps and uh, a person uh, skills can be nourished and invested in throughout the journey. Also networking and meeting with uh, like-minded uh, entre entrepreneurs can really add uh, to the person uh, and it, it, it can help out with your skills and your negotiation skills and it can gives you gives you a, a widened horizon when you deal with people like-minded. The challenges are plenty when it comes to the fintech because it's a very new uh, field and it's dominated by male. Also, I don't see it as a negative thing. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, males are supporting women who are willing to enter that uh, field where usually men uh, is taking over. But the nature of fintech is very rapid and disruptive. And also one of the challenges, well, the knowledge gap, like uh, if someone comes from a financial background, will have some lack uh, in knowledge when it comes to IT and vice versa. Uh, the public relation outreach might be a bit uh, challenging as well, uh, since technology is all about collaboration. So you have to go and seek people and talk to people and to companies and financial institution and also the central bank. And I'll be reflecting on my own theoretical framework on the next slide, showing the stakeholder of uh, the FinTech spectrum. Communication is another challenging aspect, which you have to maintain a proper communication that is uh, strong and you can benefit from uh, all the stakeholders. Business model, uh, not necessarily matching the categories of the legislated model of Central Bank of Bahrain. So I think anyone wants to enter the FinTech uh, uh, field should be aware of what is going on with the Central Bank of Bahrain because some modules or activities are not legislated yet. So we have to make sure that it fits. Collaboration with financial institution could be a challenging thing because it, it, it maybe take a sense of uh, uh, that they, we are competing with them or replacing them, but not necessarily. Uh, I, I believe that financial institution who can have a grasp of the importance of having technology uh, transformation to adopt to uh, fintechs 
to keep on maintaining their situation or uh, their positioning in the market. And again, uh, the investment as well uh, could be an, a, a challenging fact, especially that uh, the regulator comes in and uh, sometimes you have to be uh, licensed and licensing uh, can take a big cut of from, from the investors and that uh, might be not lucrative enough for investors. So it's a matter of having proper negotiation with the investors, how to approach them, how to convince them with the idea and all of that. Uh, this is the communication KPIs, and basically this is a, a, a theoretical framework that have been created given that I won incubation with Bahrain Fintech B uh, after winning uh, the award from uh, Central Bank of Bahrain and Benefit. It shows basically uh, a circle uh, of communication and what's inside reflecting the FinTech spectrum, uh, which is uh, you can find the Central Bank of Bahrain, the compliance regulation sandbox is where uh, the rules and regulation is set. And then you can find uh, where the ideas come in from the participants and entrepreneurs where opportunity zone uh, is actually intersect with the uh, ecosystem or the organization culture of the competitions. And also then uh, we move to the assessment where the entrepreneur can assess uh, their product or their idea with a near, uh, their knowledge skills, their financial, legal, coding, and negotiations, where they have to enhance their skills within that uh, mentioned uh, skills. And then it can be nourished when you get incubated uh, through human capital, which is building the team, having proper leadership, networking, and also through mentorship. Then it moves to the validation where you ensure that it's validated and you have your prototype and all of that through the community, through the network, public relations, support group. And I emphasize that it's very important for every entrepreneur because it's a bumpy road to have a support uh, group where they care about your mental health because sometimes it, you go really excited, sometimes you get uh, disappointed because uh, there is internal and external factors that can play a role. And then the exposure, uh, which is where you come and pitch uh, your idea and product to the investments, either in, uh, international or local, and also investment facilitator. Then it moves to adoption. And the adoption is a bit challenging, as I mentioned before, having a, a proper financial institution who can adopt your fintech and they uh, maybe invest in your idea as well. And uh, I would mention as well banks, insurance, and terabit gateway for the open banking fintechs. Uh, then it moves back to uh, uh, the approvals and uh, you know licensing or whatever required by Central Bank of Bahrain. Now the communication all through the stakeholder uh, should be uh, very efficient, uh, and uh, it the, the KPIs of the communication between all the stakeholders should be uh, measured through KPIs, which is the baseline, the responses, and the feedback from each stakeholder, and the track engagement, uh, the turnover the reach and the team, of course, uh, plays a big role by creating a, a people-oriented uh, organization, organization culture. So it enriched the creativity within the spectrum because uh, not every idea should be uh, money generating. Some uh, fintech ideas can reflect on other um, economic and scale like ECG and uh, it could uh, bring uh, employment, for instance, and it can bring value out of data analysis. Uh, from my perspective, when it comes to FinTech, the best leadership style that fits, uh, given uh, that it should be agile and resilient, is basically should uh, follow one of the, or all of the, uh, the following style, which is the transformational, democratic, servant, and least effort. And for me personally, I've been leading uh, both of my startups with, the, uh, with those type of leadership, and it works perfectly, creating an environment where uh, each part of uh, my team uh, can express and bring ideas, and we, I make them feel like it's their home. They are free to share and open, uh, and even if we make mistakes, and I always believe that a leader should not always know the, the answers. It's fine if I don't know the answers, as long as I have a strong team, who I can rely on and they can, you know, uh, be committed to what I'm doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kauthar. Uh, especially like the framework uh, to handle the uh, competition. And uh, we'll discuss that further in the panel discussion. Moving forward, I would like to introduce uh, Anfal Ahmed. She's the founder and CEO of Square Funds, and she will give her 
her experience about uh, her journey in the fintech uh, world. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will start by sharing the screen. Yes. One second. Okay, one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you so much everyone for having me. Hello everyone, my name is Anfal Ahmed. Uh, I am the CEO and the founder of Square Fund. Uh, Square Fund is an uh, online financial advisor powered by the artificial intelligence that provides optimal investment proposal to investors. So our journey started actually at the end of 2019 when we entered the regulatory sandbox as the robo advisory aggregator service provider. And inshallah, this month, it will be the last month and we'll graduate from the sandbox and we get the license. So today uh, I will be, uh, I will be talk, uh, taking you all through the changes faced by the FinTech and the changes and uh, innovation FinTech is bringing about and also be talking about the regulatory sandbox and how it can help businesses. Okay, so the challenges faced in fintech, we have noticed that the financial industry in MENA has reshaped with an explosion of technology, innovation, globalizations, and changing consumer expectation as well. And the pandemic helped in accelerating actually the digitalizations. So the challenges, it fits all kinds of uh, businesses, okay? But today I would like to, hi to highlight for uh, the, um, the top challenges I feel FinTech facing are, okay? So the first one is actually the growth and scalability issues. Okay. Uh, growth and scalability, uh, the first issue, uh, sorry, the, the first challenge you might face if you're looking to have a fintech startup is the, the growth and the scalability issues, when, uh, which I think is the biggest challenge is not like, uh, it's not a piece of cake to enter a new market and go internationally so fast. If you, uh, if you take the example of the uh, popular social media app like TikTok, Okay, it's very easy for such a social media platform to go viral and make the operation relatively easier. Otherwise, the fintech have to adhere to each country compliance and regulations, and it's very restricted. So for the fintech company, expansion typically relies on developing local banking relationship, along as the comparison process that heavily stagnate the growth. Okay. Uh, then we let's move to the second challenge, which I think is the anti-money laundering and the KYC. Okay, uh, most of us we know what is anti-money laundering is the set of the procedures and law and regulation designed to stop the practice of generating income through illegal actions. So fintech and any kind of many service businesses are subjected to harsh level of securities. Uh, my point of view, okay, if the procedures, okay, for the anti-money um, uh, anti money laundering and the KYC are not adopted to the day digitalization, it actually might harm the fintech businesses and customer this, uh, and lead to the customer dissatisfactions. Uh, let me give you an example. Okay, till today we have Bahrain Barsa or Bahrain Clear is asking for the original customer document for opening a new investor account. And some financial institutions are not accepting the online signature and other way of digital identity, uh, identity verifications, which I think that will make a priority for making everything digitalized if you only depending on the original and, and uh, you want the customer to come to the branch and sign. Okay. So the third challenge, I think also uh, it's... Uh, Will, you, you will face at the a fintech startup is the, the funding, okay? Because the operation cost is one of the main expenses which require big investment. And it's very necessary, okay, uh, to secure 
uh, to secure registrations and to be able to operate in the market. Also, the, the, the big data and the AI are the two necessary technology for the modern fintech. However, this technology are challenging to implement as they require exceptional engineering skills and constant maintenance, which it come with the high cost. To, uh, uh, if you want to hire the experts to handle this technology. Okay, and uh, regard the precede challenge. Okay, precede, I think it's funding also, it's very hard to get an angel investment, uh, sorry, investors in MENA, especially in MENA. Because, uh, and you need that to prove your MVP and to enter the market. And most of the VCs are investing in the latest investment ground Okay, starting from the seed funding and CRA and B and C and C uh, and so on. Um, yeah, that regard the funding. Okay, let's move the last challenge. Okay, which I think it's also you will may face the competition. Yes. So today, fintech company who's competing, they're competing with the say uh, with the some of the largest existing financial powerhouse like bank and financial institutions, which increase the barriers to entries. So because already this uh, customer, their uh, sorry uh, existing business, are having the trust with their client and everything, and they are dominating the market. Okay, the financial mina market is highly competitive and it's very important that the printing company that differentiates its product and service to ensure their defensibility okay it's essential is to find first your gap market and your target uh, and target the right audience and then gain the competitive edge will make you different than the other uh, competitor in the market Okay, now I cover the main four, sorry, uh, I cover the main four challenges. Now we would like to discuss the new changes or challenges and innovation it happened now in the market, which I think that would lead to the new opportunities. So since the pandemic, okay, uh, since the pandemic, the traditional institution, as we all notice, has even the government, are move and shifting their service online. And customers today can access to the world with the click of button. And the, uh, and the automation service is not only save their time and money and effort, and also we, uh, we notice it's more efficient. So now the customer and uh, companies are more adopting to the technology Okay, and which I think that it make more easier for your customer. Then if we talk about the investment, okay, uh, I will give you example about the robo advisor. I think, I think is the changes that robo advisor is bringing, uh, is changing the conventional way of investing. Okay, so before the robo advisory, it can, Investor had only two way of investing, which the first one either to invest by themselves or to hire an expert, which it proved to be very expensive. But how robo advisory have have changed the game by providing investment propo proposal and wealth management, which it's easy uh, of use, and minimum investment value with the low cost and fees. This has especially benefits like the younger uh, the younger generations okay who don't have the expertise needed to handle their own investment and money the same thing what i think it happened for the open banking as well okay is reshaping the competitive landscape and consumer also experience of banking industry by using the open uh, abis uh, so you, you will find this opportunity, it has opened a new ways and product and service that could help customer and small even business and medium businesses to get better deals. It also gives the user the more detailed understanding of their account and help them find new ways to take, their, uh, to take the most of their money, okay? So Alhamdulillah, we notice like the, um, the, the market is shifting fast, okay? And the regulation now it's taking place in Bahrain. Okay. So 
I'm going fast or something. Okay, Anton, you can go, can continue, please. Ah, okay. Okay, that's... We have that's... few minutes left, so we can, we can start the panel discussion. Okay. So let's, uh, because uh, I add this one, uh, what's called, should you apply for the regulatory sandbox? Many of the starter, uh, sorry, startup and entrepreneur, they ask me the same question, how your experience in, uh, in, the, sand, uh, in the sandbox and uh, should we apply or not? So the question why you should apply. So we know that the CBB Reality Sandbox is one of the kind opportunity which act as a stepping stone in the inceptions and enters in the market for the business in their infancy. So if you have a, uh, for example, if you, if you are a founder and uh, it helps you to understand your market better, okay? And if you have a, a MVB ready, it helps you to prepare for the next stage. So you can understand your market better and your customer, how can they react to your solution and you see the challenges in the market well before you entering and proceeding to acquire the license. Also, it helps you to remodel your MVB and make changes to your solutions all while maintaining your reputation of your company. Last, it does not require large funds as you be operating on small scale only. I think this is the biggest benefit, okay? So, the last thing why you may not need to apply, okay? Uh, if you already have solution tested before and you have well established locally or internationally business, then instead of going to the sandbox, you can obtain the license directly. Or you want to enter to the market and your competitor has only the same solution on uh, in, your, uh, in the market. So in this case, uh, Entering the sandbox, it will not be beneficial for you. It's you, it, it's better to go to a, for the licensing directly. Uh, all what I said now, it's uh, from my experience and what I have, and this is only just my opinion. Okay, and of course, uh, regard the sandbox and everything. You can go contact um, uh, the the regulatory there's, and ask the team from the sandbox. They will help you, of course. So that, I hope I cover everything. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Anfal, and wish you all the best with, the, with your uh, authentic uh, business. We'd like to see more of such product that you and Kauthar have uh, worked on, especially in, in, in FinTech as well. Okay, thank so, you, Ahmed. Thank you, Anfal. So um, uh, we move to the last part of uh, our event today, which is the uh, panel discussion. So I would like to ask uh, all the uh, uh, our guest speakers to turn on their uh, cam camera and uh, and uh, we'll 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 start uh, discussing. And the main, really, the main uh, thing we want to focus on is uh, first is uh, the main theme of this event, which is women uh, and technology. Uh, what uh, what are the challenges? What are the uh, opportunities? And probably share with our uh, participant that. And we would like also to give some time for uh, our participants to um, uh, to ask you questions, whether in the chat box or the Q and A. So maybe I'll just open up uh, with um, with a, with a, a question. Anyone uh, can answer it uh, from you. What inspired you uh, to start uh, your uh, business using technology and, uh, and, uh, and what are the opportunities that you've seen and what are the challenges you have faced? So I'll leave the floor for anyone who would like to ask. I may go first, Ahmed. Okay. Yeah, and then Anfal and will come back to you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, well, um... Again, as I said before, uh, the entrepreneurship is a journey of uh, discovery. Uh, and it's basically, we start discovering ourselves as we go and we grow. And for me, I've worked, um, I began my career working as an employee and I discovered that sometimes the organizational culture doesn't fit with me because I'm a leader by nature. So I believe I want to create uh, an environment where I can lead people to creativity. And it goes sometimes that 
it's micromanagement and and uh, talents are been uh, you know buried because we are not heard or something so this is one of the reasons and the other reason is I'm up for challenges uh, I enjoy taking risks and I believe that it, it's a uh, um, something uh, that in all entrepreneurs that we're seeking rest. Put us there, we want uh, to be in the middle of challenges and we figure out things and we bring solution. So a creativity is part of it as well. Being so creative, uh, getting bored from routine, doing the same thing for a long period of time uh, or repeating the same thing all over in years is something that is uh, will not add uh, to any person uh, character or knowledge or enhance the, the career. So I was very ambitious person, and um, through uh, my career, I always like I found that in myself. Even if I do a job uh, from eight to five or eight to four, I was there to bring to my superior something different, projects from outside. Let's do this. Let's fix this a process. Let's enhance it somehow. And it's always involved technology. I always want to bring technology in. So I was like, okay. And I also, I find it in myself that I love supporting people and. The, the last job that I had, it was in community uh, engagement, and I was running local and international projects when it comes to health awareness. Uh, it's either in Bahrain or outside Bahrain. That was the Royal uh, College of Surgeons of Ireland. And I discovered that I enjoy it best, and I spent so much hours in volunteering and you know helping out people. And I, and I always wanted to do something that helps community. And my fintech is basically, it's creating and it's designated for uh, you know, the social um, segment and also it's for the community. So I was thinking why not to bring people together to support each other financially instead of going to the bank and paying a very high interest while we can utilize people assets where they can uh, support each other. And the slogan of EGMAIA is together more. So basically I, I come from my own intentions and it, it reflects me as a person. Uh, and it's my personal objective that I want uh, EGMIA to support uh, anyone uh, in Bahrain. And I have a vision that uh, today we can start Jamia from with someone from Europe or uh, from the US. So this is basically, it comes from me as a, in, from a, per, a personal perspective. Uh, thank you, Kalthar. Uh, and Fal, if you would like to uh, answer this question. Mute. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So actually, before I started the Square Funds, uh, I was working as a financial broker uh, with the International Financial Broker. So the, the customer the, who's coming to invest was looking for something is not available in our company. So they're looking for secure investment for their kids' education, for their uh, retirement, for something. You know, they want to invest and save their money. And it seemed like there is no products are available. So I have to be very honest with them. Like most of the investment secret that we have it, it's contained derivative and it's with a high risk. So it's not suitable for, the, for you. The coming question is coming like, uh, so what is the most suitable investment for me? So I was like, uh, okay, uh, let me search for you. So I was, uh, I have my connection with uh, my friend and everything. So I was thinking uh, there is a lot of investment product that available in the market are suitable, but um, are suitable for the individual investors, but uh, uh, the customer or the investor, they don't know what the most, uh, where the opportunity and how they can get there. And they don't understand how the investment structure is going. So that's how it come and uh, Square Funds and Online Financial Advisor, that it help you to understand it. Uh, it help you get the optimal uh, investment opportunity online and you can manage and plan your investment and financially online as well <coughs> that's it thank you and uh, amy uh, hannah if you want to uh, touch base on the challenges opportunities for women and technology anything to add yeah i would like to add one little thing actually well i don't know how little it is it depends if you know this or not because in my experience during my startup days, I would say that uh, and there's a lot that's available within our ecosystem that people don't know about. 
And so you embark on this journey, right? And you have this idea in tech and you have that push and that drive and the resilience, you're getting in there, but you, but in some cases you sort of don't know where to go. So what I like yeah, I to, ahead, um, I'd, I'd like to tell, um, so I'd like to tell um, my, my, my friends, my colleagues out there that the, the startup commu community in Bahrain is, is big. It's very mature, actually. And there are so many like incubators, accelerators that you can approach um, for, for assistance, for guidance. In terms of mentorship, uh, for me, one of the key, I think, elements in creating diversity, not, it was not that I had the idea and I knew that there was a gap in the market and you know I had access to sort of a finance at the time, but it was actually that mentor that, that sat me down and said, you know what? Um, I love your idea, and I think this is where you need to go with it, and this is what you, these are the first sort of steps that you need to take to get onto that journey. So uh, I think without those that sort of mentorship and support that you can take advantage of in Bahrain, um, it would be very difficult to sort of get in and compete with like-minded individuals who are sort of competing in the same industry. The, my point here being is um, go out there, network, uh, get to know your 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 um, fellow friends, your fellow colleagues. Um, go on LinkedIn. Get in touch with people. Uh, even here, you know, just looking at around at the speakers. You know, Amy, I know you, and Paul, I've know I know you. Kauthar is my partner in crime this year in terms of the Halcyon uh, Women's uh, Women's Program. So, yeah, um, just get out there and make friends. Get to know people. Take advice and use what the system has in place for you. Because Bahrain took so long in terms of um, uh, putting all this together for you. So use it and take advantage of the things that are around you. Um, go to an incubator, sit down and meet with like-minded individuals, apply to a, an accelerator program when you see it there, go on to Startup Bahrain and find out what the latest information is so that you can actually get involved and use those things. So I think that's my, um, that's my uh, little piece of advice, I think, uh, for this. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a. Uh, we'll 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 take some questions from our uh, uh, participants, and then we can go back to other questions. Uh, maybe this question is um, uh, could uh, from uh, one of the participants. Maybe uh, Anfal or Kauthar can answer them. What would you recommend to someone who wants to start a business, fintech or non fintech? Uh, and what's the future of fintech in Bahrain? Kauthar? Uh, yeah, I, can, I could answer because I have both. I have fintech and non-fintech. Um, actually, it depends on your passion. What do you love? What do you like as a person? So uh, being an entrepreneur, you have to enjoy what you do. It's not like you are asked to do a job and it's from just eight hours a day and you have to go leave go home because literally sometimes you need to work till you sleep 12 hours or maybe more so uh, you have to be passionate about the idea and the thing that you want to work on uh, for the second part of the question uh, what is the future of the fintech there is a bright bright future for fintechs uh, it's it's something new and uh, we have uh, the right environment for it in Bahrain. Uh, we have with the support of the Central Bank of Bahrain and also with the Soundbox and also uh, finding the right accelerator, as Hannah said, and the incubator and uh, referring back to the right mentor, you can do great, but you have to go through the phases of making sure uh, that your idea is uh, profitable and is right and it fits with the market, do a proper research, network, ask people around you. So it's not which one is better, it's about your passion again and you doing uh, your job of searching and asking and communicating with like-minded people. Interesting, Kata, very insightful. Uh, and Fal, any thought uh, on uh, this question? I think Kata, they, they, she like, you know, answer everything. Okay. It's the same thing I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important that uh, you're passionate uh, about that. Uh, and uh, if we uh, go to another uh, question from uh, our uh, participants, and this is applicable to all, uh, all of uh, a few, uh, is that um, uh, how do you get funding, especially when the investment needed to materialize I, uh, I, uh, ideas? I mean, 
So um, any thought on how to get funding and maybe specifically any challenges to get funding because, uh, uh, because uh, it's a woman or it's in a technology or it's a, in a specific uh, uh, domain. So uh, how do we go about securing those uh, funding? Um, I would like to say that uh, what Hannah said earlier is actually very relevant here. There are so many programs for entrepreneurs that you simply just have to apply to them. And Ahmed, you said about like, are there challenges specifically for women entrepreneurs? This is true around the world, but because of that, here in the Middle East, they have made an extra focus to make sure that women can enter the space. So there are many funds and many programs specifically for female entrepreneurs. So definitely women should take advantage of those. Um, but I also think it's important that you should just start at like a beta level of your idea, whatever it is, rather than blow out all the stops. And for that, you should be willing to put in a little bit of your own money or borrow it from friends and family to start, prove the concept. And then you have something so concrete to show to the people that you're asking for more funding, but it's definitely available. Or we can use Kalthar Business e to collect some money as well. That's a smashing idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the purposes is to support entrepreneurs instead of we go seek a uh, little amount of money for, from investors while they take a big cut in it. When you have the right team, you can all collaborate, then you share uh, the company, uh, share between the team. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, it's there and it can support uh, the same concept that you just mentioned, Ahmed. And I would like to add to what Amy said. Uh, some entrepreneurs, they just look locally, uh, while there is international firms who can also fund uh, projects uh, globally. So uh, I would recommend as well for anyone. And money has never been an obstacle. If the idea is brilliant, it's great, it will bring the money not the other way around. So people need to know this because sometimes they put a burden like, oh, I don't have the funding, I don't have the money. Just start, keep on pushing for it, start working on it. And when the idea is perfect or it's brilliant, the money will come. It's going to be a magnet. Okay, uh, thank you. I'd and, like to add uh, something, Ahmed. If, yes, if that, please go ahead. Anna. Just very quickly. Um, during the, my time when I when I first started that listening, I had another idea. Um, and I just thought, you know, let me go and, and, and check and see, you know, the viability of this. So I pitched it to uh, Step Saudi and I managed to win even before I even did anything or even was looking into uh, creating this MVP. It was literally an idea stage. It managed to win. I don't know whether it was $5,000 or $10,000. So my point is, Take advantage of these competitions um, that are around you. Uh, there's always something going on, whether it's for female founders or even um, any sort of specific subsector. So if you're looking at uh, fintech, if you're looking at edtech, you can you can actually approach these um, organizations all over the world, accelerators um, and and you know competitions and be able to get access to a little bit of funding to start. Um, up until recently, um, uh, I know that Tempkin had an MVP program, so they offered up to 10,000 dinars to actually create your, your, your idea for the startup. Um, I don't know if it's still going on now, but I know that uh, Tempkin have just revamped their programs. And, uh, you know, everyone thinks if you haven't entered the space that it might be difficult to achieve, but with a good business plan and a good um, you know, background, you should be able to approach Tempkin and actually get a little bit of funding so that you could start your, 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 your startup, uh, regardless on what industry it is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very important point for people to be aware of and to actually take that step and, and going through their application process and, and seeing how, mu how much or how, you know, even in terms of wage support schemes, you know, you can always take advantage of something that the ecosystem has built in there to support you. Very informative, Hannah. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe um, last question from my side, given the uh, we're running late. Um, you know, as a father of two uh, daughters, What's your advice uh, to parents like me to uh, nourish my daughters and to become uh, entrepreneurs in, in the entrepreneurial world and, and, uh, and, and fintech? Any, uh, any tips? Uh, 
I do. <laughs> Being an edtech platform, I can tell you so many different things that you could do. Number one is hire a private tutor from Derrisni. <laughs> Get some art classes or whatever from, from there. But, you know, uh, joking aside, um, there are so many programs for kids. I was looking at um, even in coding recently, there is a company called White Hat Junior that was in the news as well um, that uh, get children to get introduced to coding um, and then they would actually be selected after building their MVP, their app, and to be able to pitch in front of Silicon Valley investors. You know, that's the, that, that's the amount of support that is there for children. Um, in terms of getting them interested in, um, there's, a, there's an amazing academy here called Fab Lab. Um, I don't know if you know about it, but they could get um, you know, involved in building mechanics and IoT sort of platforms. And you can do that extremely early. Mm -hmm. uh, in age and, and get them just sort of interested in these things uh, so that you can prepare them for when they're older. Thank you, Anna. So any uh, last uh, remarks from our uh, esteemed uh, panelists before we conclude? Um, I would like to add to Hannah because I'm a single mom as well. I have a daughter, she's uh, 12. Uh, I would recommend that you read a book called uh, Poor Dad, Rich Dad. Uh, and it's very rich. It gives like a, a, a nice, insightful, um, tips of how you can, we can raise our kids in a way that we uh, you know, enhance their confidence and maybe you start giving them some cash, see what they do with it. And you know, just give them that space where they can exp express themselves. It's very important. Thank you for it. Okay. So I think that uh, brings us to the conclusion of uh, our event. Uh, I think the organizers will send a link, uh, a survey link for our participants to uh, answer. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists. We meet today at the backdrop of Mother's Day yesterday and uh, it was a Women International Day. And this is very important for us as a society to be inclusive and, and really uh, collaborate each other, with each other to uh, not only to empower women, but to empower our society which is, uh, which is very important. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Mishal, the chairman of TBS, uh, to allow us this platform to share experience and to talk about this important topic. So thank you very much for all the participants and attendees to this, and special thanks for our esteemed panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And wishing you the best of luck on your tech journey. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. This was a wonderful event. Thank you, Amy, for being part of it. Thank you.